Technology has made academic dishonesty much easier. It's probably a little easier to cheat online. See how technology is used to minimize cheating and also address the differences between cheating in the classroom and in online courses on this edition of Equal Time. From San Jose State University, you're watching Equal Time, exploring new issues each week, giving equal time to competing points of view. Welcome to the campus of San Jose State University and this edition of Equal Time. I'm your host, Journalism School Director Bob Rucker. Do college students cheat more in online courses? What are college faculty doing about it? Technology vendors have developed techniques to minimize cheating and address the issues surrounding cheating in online courses and in the classroom. Calvin Carr has our story. In our digital age, college students have greater access to information thanks to the internet and their mobile devices. However, they also have more methods of cheating electronically. College students changing perceptions of what is ethical and what is original have professors searching for new ways of dealing with academic dishonesty. English professor Renee Swenson teaches at Saddleback College in Orange County. You see almost 50% of the students plagiarizing, downloading full papers, Swenson has taught in the classroom and online for 16 well, years and says the cut-and-paste generation of college students is unaware of what constitutes academic dishonesty. Yes. Digital natives do not understand, you know, really what cheating is or why. Um, there's a lot of gray area. Uh, what I've noticed is uh, students today tend to not want to or don't really know how to think for themselves. Online classes are becoming more and more popular today for a variety of reasons, but Swenson says this new method of course delivery increases academic dishonesty. From uh, the conversations I've had with other academics that are interested in academic honesty and academic integrity, there is a, a sense that it's happening more in online courses than it is elsewhere. But researchers at Marshall University in West Virginia at the Educational Foundations and Technology Office say cheating is no more prevalent in online courses. Interestingly enough, uh, our research showed that the percentage of students who admitted to cheating behaviors in online and live classes was the same, uh, roughly about a third. However, public perception persists that cheating is rampant within online courses. One of the questions we asked in our study was, uh, we asked the students to identify the percentage of students they thought cheated in online classes and percentage they thought cheated in a traditional class. And the percentages was roughly, the, the typical percentage given was around 62 percent. Respondents thought just 12 percent of students cheated in traditional classes, which is nothing close to the actual results. Anecdotally, faculty feel the same way, uh, you know, that, that because, uh, you know, that loss of oversight or loss of control. While the research shows that the amount of cheating is equal in the classroom as well as online, the question remains, is there a fundamental shift in what is considered to be academic dishonesty in the digital age? That's an interesting topic that, that's really just now being looked at. I mean, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years or, or you know, even more, um, we seem to be, from an educational standpoint, pushing more uh, group work and, and individual, and even in individual assignments, they're, they're more a deeper understanding, not the objective multiple choice true false test. What is considered now as dishonesty because of collaboration may be confusing students. SJSU electrical engineering professor Kazro Gadiri says academic dishonesty can be avoided in both the classroom and in online courses. Students need to be taught not to cheat. We should give the student a moral compass, teaching them what the morality is and what is our ethic of our profession. We, we tell them there is no shortcut, there is no cutting corner. If you want to achieve something in your life, you really should put your time and effort to it to achieve it. He says if teachers do their job properly, Students won't have to cheat, and there must be zero tolerance for cheating. We shouldn't tolerate it. We should make an example that 
everyone else from outside and inside look at it and come to this conclusion that they shouldn't cheat. Gadiri incorporated lessons from a massive open online course, or MOOC, in one of his classes last year. He says professor and students both benefit from the internet. The most importantly, the student learn how to search the web. A lot of information these days, you don't go to the library for it. You search it on the search engine and web. So they learn how to do that, and they are very eloquent on that. But with the good comes the bad. Is there going to be a cheating? Always. But we try as much as possible, prevent it and deter it. In order to deter it, SJSU mathematics education professor Julie Sliva Spitzer says students need to learn what cheating is. I'm not sure in this day and age if students understand that line. That's why it's really important for us to teach explicitly what cheating is and what it is not, because I think sometimes they don't know. In spite of the potential for cheating, Spitzer says online learning offers many advantages. We have many students here at San Jose State who work full time, they have jobs, and they take sometimes a full load here. And I really don't know how they do it. And being able to take an online class lightens their load in some way because they don't have to come to campus. They can do it from home after their kids go to bed or they can do it on the weekends. It's, it's a way to provide access to more students that wouldn't have access to it before. Spitzer says concern is overblown about increased opportunities to cheat online. It, it's interesting. It doesn't occur to me that students who would be taking these courses online would do that because of the level of work that's involved in an online class. I feel like it's a lot more than if they come in and they just sit in class a few hours a week. In class and online, SJSU graduate student Vanessa Zucker has seen cheating firsthand. She's also a teaching assistant and understands why it exists. I think college students cheat when they don't have time to balance their lives and manage their time correctly so that they can study enough. She says online or in the classroom, opportunities to cheat are plentiful. It just depends on what kind of strategies the students are going to use. It's probably a little easier to cheat online just because you can open a new page and Google search or if you have a second screen, maybe the proctor won't see you. But in person as well, you can cheat whether it's a large class or a small class. There are just different techniques that students use. When we come back, college faculty discuss the reasons for academic dishonesty and what's being done. Welcome back. Students cheat for a variety of reasons, and tech vendors have joined forces with college faculty to minimize academic dishonesty. But do college students cheat more in their online courses than they do in traditional classrooms? How are educators ensuring academic integrity in our culture of learning? Calvin Carr continues our report. With the internet fully integrated into college education, the dark side of this technology is a real concern. But with every challenge, there is an opportunity. Tech vendors have stepped in to curb academic dishonesty. Jason Chu is senior education manager at Oakland-based Turnitin. His company helps instructors catch plagiarism by checking what they write against web-based sources. It's sort of saying, you know, did cheating exist before technology, did technology perpetuate or increase uh, the uh, student's ability to cheat, it's very hard to say. His company studied 38 million papers last year and found 156 million content matches to sources online. What we did is we categorized those matches by whether it's uh, an academic homework site, uh, whether it's a cheat site, paper mill site, or it's an encyclopedia, uh, for example, Wikipedia. So we bucketed those, uh, uh, those matches uh, under those broad categories. 
Chu says there is this notion that collaboration is appropriate by virtue of the fact that it's online. I think that where we fall into problems, perhaps, is where we're not clear what constitutes appropriate collaboration in an online course. Chu says you don't see as many issues around collaboration in a classroom because there are clear expectations that students should own their own work. But when you're in an online environment where part of the process of being in the class is participating in an online discussion forum, blogging, sharing ideas, it's very, I think it's very easy to allied collaboration with what's appropriate. What's appropriate during an online exam is monitored here at ProctorU, an Alabama-based company with an office in Pleasanton. Before co-founding ProctorU, Don Kastner helped found an online university after teaching economics at SJSU. He developed parameters for proctoring. It's really online or in the classroom. It's how you set the rules up and who monitors that. In the classroom, it's the faculty mem member. Online, it's technology. It's different tools that we're going to use. So what's the process of minimizing exam cheating online? It's really three steps. The first one, to see the student, we use a webcam, sort of similar to a Skype conference. It's sort of a one-on-one -on -one experience where we've got the proctor in our center. They connect via web conference to the student. We can see them. We can have them secure their environment. They can take their laptop, and they can show us everything around their area. We can make sure they don't have things out. We can really secure the environment. Not only is the online testing environment secured, but the online proctor can see what's on the student's screen and can help with computer issues. The third part of the proctoring system validates the identity of the test taker. We have to know who they are, so we go through a process to authenticate their identity. And we're, we're using IDs, we're using permanent photographs, but we're also using uh, public record uh, data. The technology is there to verify the student's identity and secure the testing environment. And while honesty may be the best policy, cheating may still come down to the professor's diligence and the student's integrity. Welcome back to this edition of Equal Time. Our focus today is on college cheating. Let's meet our guests. Thanks, Bob. Hi, I'm Don Kastner. I'm the president of uh, ProctorU. I'm also the former president of Andrew Jackson University, and I was a uh, faculty in the economics department here at San Jose State. Thanks, Don. Hi, I'm Jason Chu, uh, senior education manager for Turnitin. Uh, we're the leading provider of plagiarism prevention and student writing evaluation software. Hi, I'm Vanessa Zucker. I am a student in the Graduate Business School at SJSU. I'm also the VP of Marketing for the Student Association and a teaching assistant. And hi, I'm Renee Swenson, and I'm a professor of English at Saddleback College, a community college in Southern California. Hi, I'm Calvin Carr. I'm a graduate student here at uh, the School of Journalism and Mass Communications at San Jose State University, and I'm the producer of today's show. Thank you all for being here today. You know, the public hears all the national and local announcements about programs at San Jose State and other schools delivering product online, delivering education online, and yet this issue of cheating is starting to be a concern. What are we doing in technology to resolve that issue? Well, what we're doing at ProctorU, we, we proctor online examinations, and really what we've done is we've, we've brought the proctoring center to the, to the student's home. Uh, when I was running Andrew Jackson University, I had a student tell me I can do all my coursework at home at my kitchen table, but I, when it comes to take a test, I have to go somewhere, and this is a hassle, and I'm already stressed. So what we've done is we've brought technology to the home. We, with a webcam and with screen sharing technology and with authentication technology, we can see the student, we can see what they're doing, we know who they are, and those are the same three things you do in the classroom. So really, in the online world, we're trying to replicate what we do in the classroom and then take it to the next level. Renee, you're a teacher, you know that on the college level we worry about cheating. 
Absolutely, and, and it does happen. Um, the interesting thing is it's, it's not a great proportion of my students that, are, that I find are cheating. And I don't see any difference between the amount of students that are cheating online and those that are, are not. Now, most of my work is all in writing, and so I, I deal specifically with plagiarism, um, you know, cut and paste type of content, and those types of things. And uh, <clears throat> really, I, I find that I've been able to get away from uh, focusing so much on worrying about cheating or stressing about cheating by using some of the technology tools. Uh, I use Turnitin specifically. It's an inherent part of what goes on in my classroom. And so I'm able to teach students how to write better um, by having them use Turnitin as a formative assessment to check their work. And then I can actually spend more time on, on real teaching in that case. Very good. Turnitin is your company, your program. Yeah. Tell me how faculty feel using the technology. Well, I think that uh, as with any technology that you introduce into a classroom context, you're going to have folks that are sort of leaders, they're going to be advocates for using it, and they have some folks who are sort of used to doing things the way they've always done them. Um, I think what we try to do with uh, Turnitin is obviously provide opportunities for instructors as well as students, as Renee pointed out, to really look at how they're using content within their papers. But we also, and I think this is uh, sort of touching on where technology is going in terms of engagement, we provide instructors with a way to provide students with more targeted feedback. So whether that's a voice comment uh, on their paper, or it's providing them with resources to look up, perhaps what a comma splice means, we're providing different modalities to reach students where they are. And I think that's really what the promise of technology is in terms of introducing in the classroom. I think that's really where we're going to see a lot of growth. Now we'll get back to the jitters of some of the faculty having to learn the new technology. But Vanessa, as a student in, the, in a program where you embrace this, have we pretty much come to a conclusion people don't cheat anymore because new technology doesn't allow it? Oh, or certainly it? not. I've seen cheating in the classroom and online. I don't think there's a really big difference. I don't think you can mitigate it completely no matter where you are. But you have to just make sure that you motivate the students and you get them to a point where they are responsible enough for themselves and they have some kind of connection. They feel as though if they cheat, then they're losing something. I think that we really have to change you know, the whole perception or um, philosophy of education, that there's nothing to cheat for if we're not looking for a specific answer. Uh, and, and really fostering critical thinking so that students use foundational knowledge to then apply that knowledge in some way, rather than what's the answer, this is the right answer or the wrong answer. Um, and, you know, being innovative in how you approach your assignments or uh, you know, being creative, my classroom is very dialogic in both my online and in my face-to-face -face format, so students have to take what we develop in those discussions and, and use that in the paper. So there's no right answer on the internet even for them to go find and cut and paste into their papers. And why did you want to do this? Well, you know, uh, when it comes to college students today, they're part of what's called the, the digital native generation. So they've grown up uh, in a world that the internet has always existed or you know uh, many of the technologies that we're talking about have been part of their lives and uh, what I'm seeing is that uh, there's more and more of a demand from students to uh, want to learn online and yet at the same time there's that challenge of dealing with you know uh, the, the academic dishonesty being uh, incur not encouraged but uh, enhanced by some of these technologies so I do think Getting back to Renee's point, I think one of the challenges we have is one dealing with changing the perception of what is considered cheating by some of these digital natives, but also as professors uh, and uh, uh, instructors, helping them understand, helping digital natives understand what is really considered cheating. Well, and Calvin brings up a good point. It's about engagement. And so I have just as much responsibility to engage my students online as I do in the face-to-face -face classroom. And the more students are engaged, the more they'll think critically, and the less likely they'll cheat, which is you know, basically this buy-in that we want from them, that they'll feel like they're missing something. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's you know, being uh, you know, innovative and, and helping students think for themselves. Because if I write, you know, tell me about this, they'll just go to you know, Wikipedia or Google and, and tell me what everybody else thinks about this, this idea of collaboration that they have. They haven't been taught fundamentally the, the processes of thinking. 
it's almost like we have to reintroduce that. Um, I would argue getting away from tests where we consider that they can cheat, that there's an answer. Um, and all of the work that I do is, is essay-based. Of course, I'm in English, um, but I don't even test, you know, grammar or those types of things. It, it's, it's all inherent uh, in the I writing. If I could weigh in here just real quick. I think what we also see increasingly is this sense, culturally, of a disconnect between having an education and getting a job. So I think there's a way in which we're challenged just by the broader trend in terms of employment, you know, around what skills students are learning in college, what they're coming away with, and that ap applicabil applicability and value in the marketplace. So going back to Renee, I think there is a way in which we kind of need to sort of evaluate what it, I what it is that the higher in ed institution is providing in the way of skill sets mm -hmm. and s making sure that there is a connect between that and the workplace, and specifically around critical thinking, because I think that's what's valued. Well, I'm sure people are out there watching and wondering, well, the young people of today are used to technology, no question about that, but they are wondering, are they still getting from a university or from an educational environment a knowledge retention? Because if they're not retaining, playing with the toys is not gonna help them. And how will that affect them in the job market if they don't understand the concepts? Because technology made it easy for them to receive it, did they retain it? Well, can we ask ourselves how much we remember from our college you know, experience in terms of content? Probably very little. But what we did learn is we learned how to process, uh, you know, take things on, uh, uh, you know, deal with our schedules and think critically, problem solve, the basic fundamental skills. Uh, one of the arguments that I make, because I do use Turnitin and I, I really push for a, a campus-wide approach to these types of technologies, both for face-to-face -face classes and online, is it's the one tool that I can see that goes from course to course to course. So when we teach critical thinking and we wrap that in with the writing and then they're you know, engaged in this, this um, you know, feedback and that type of thing through this service, then students can do that in their English class and their biology class and their you know, uh, political science class. And it's like, oh, this again. Uh, I remember I have to do this, this, and this. Otherwise, it's a textbook here, a textbook there, and they sell it back. We, we teach them dump your knowledge uh, at the end of this at the end of this course. It's the model that we came. Yeah. I mean, that's great. I mean, I look at it; it's real exciting. Critical thinking today has never been more important because of the amount of data that we have. You know, I always like to say, look, apologies to Alex Trebek, but Jeopardy is dead. Right? It's not about what we know; it's what we can process. If you ask us a question about a fact, we can look it up and have an, that answer in two minutes, or one minute, or twenty seconds. It's the ability to take all of that different data and process it. And so, we as educators, that's our challenge. We can't sit there in a classroom and teach history and just talk about different things that happen. We really need to focus on thinking, mm -hmm. focus on evaluating, focus on taking that data and processing it. And that's what's going to be important in the job market because what we're doing today, I tell my employees, the job you're doing today is going to be different in six months. Mm -hmm. now, you have to be able to adapt to that change and process data. And so when I hear this whole discussion talking about critical thinking, it excites me because that's what we have to challenge people to do. Well, and that's one of the benefits of online um, teaching. I would say online learning. Um, I, I try to get away from the teaching. It's, it's not about me getting across content to students. And in an online environment, the students have to do most of the work. Um, you know, I set it up and I frame it and, and uh, you know, I ask them to engage in a certain way, but most of that time is actively involved in, you know, reading or coming to some sort of knowledge. The emphasis is not on me uh, giving them information. And I actually have approached that in my face-to-face -face classes so that I am fostering the same type of critical thinking. I don't go in and, and say what I want to say. It's drawing from the students as they as they sit there or they will be on their phones <laughs> looking at other information. I also feel like on that same note that it is up to the instructor but not only the instructor but whoever sets up the technology to set the stage for the students so that they become more engaged so that they can have a memorable moment during the class and then they will retain the information later. In, uh, in, in person classes, it's easier because you have a visual cue and we need to work with technology in order to figure out what makes those memorable moments in online education. And with plagiarism, this is really important. So instead of me going into the classroom or telling my students online, you can or cannot do this, I will actually ask 
them. Why do we value intellectual property? Uh, why is this important? How does this, you know, you know, uh, fundamental to what we do in academic discourse? Because I feel like students today, especially these digital natives, need that connection. They need that understanding. They're going to question why or why not to do something. And so I allow them to kind of present, and we have a, a discussion about it. So it's not about you can't cheat, it's why do we want to have uh, your voice? Why do we want to hear what you have to say um, about these topics? When you're developing technology, I remember my mom used to say, you ask the question why too much? But the question why triggers those synapses, get that mind thinking critically, you get things done. How do you develop technology to trigger the mind? to do those sort of things. When we as teachers have, have always thought, we need to see you, we need to watch your reactions, we need to look at your body language to know if you're receiving what we're telling you. Well, I think one of the things that uh, technology can provide is that essential feedback loop. I mean, Renee mentioned dialogic relationship, and I think that when it comes to the writing assessment uh, that the instructors do, with Turnitin, we're not necessarily changing that. We're finding ways in which to better create efficiencies around that and to connect instructors better with students around feedback. One of the things that we found is that students, given the fact they are digital natives now, respond better to feedback that's provided electronically. Yeah, they feel it's safer, they're more comfortable, they can play and replay back your feedback if you're leaving, for example, a voice comment, and really be able to engage with that information. And I think that where we see that benefiting instructors is that they're finding that they're, what they're doing on a paper it's going to get read. It's not just, oh, I got a B and toss it in the garbage can. It's going to be, I got a B and here are the reasons why. And I can kind of spend time and look through it. We're kind of reaching them where they are in some respects. And they can actually read our writing when it's yeah. <laughs> let me, let me Let me chime in on that. It's not about technology replacing the classroom or replacing, replacing the instructor. Right? It's about technology enabling that process. Right? We as teachers have technology that we use. There's some things we don't have to do anymore. And, but we're still responsible for that engagement. We're still responsible for that learning process. We still have to direct the student. We want to engage in that conversation. We want to exchange ideas with them and lead them down that path. Because they've got all the facts. They've got the technology. They've got all these pieces they can put into play. And we can take that and, and get them to the next level and drive it to them. So that's what I say to faculty. I say, don't be afraid of technology. Embrace it. It's going to help you be much more effective than you are today. The guy standing in front of the, the classroom with 50 people or 100 students, and he's using a PowerPoint presentation, that's not very interactive. 20 years ago, that was amazing. But today, it's not. And, this, and everyone's growing up in this environment, digitally enabled. They're used to different streams of technology. They're used to very short bits of information. You know, give me that Facebook information. Give me that, that Twitter feed. And they want, to, they want to engage that way. There could be people listening to us, though, right now, Calvin, and, and they'll say, what he says makes sense, and what you're saying certainly enhances the learning experience for students. But faculty and parents will probably think, well, wait a minute, these little bits, will it ever come together? Will it ever co be cohesive enough to create a collective thought that will be valuable for the future, for that job, for whatever they want to do? And what is the research telling us about stereotypes and about technology enabling cheating? Well, there's a couple points there. Uh, on the cheating side, the research uh, proves that the cheating that's going on in, the, in online courses is about equivalent to what's going on in the classroom. However, and this is where I got involved in this in the development of my online course uh, for my graduate program, uh, I'm dealing with the perception in the marketplace of the parents, of the students, that there's a lot more cheating going on in the online environment. This is a fascinating discussion. Thank you for bringing us to our attention, and thank you for joining us. We hope you will come back for another edition of Equal Time.